So I'll focus in the talk on lossy trapdoor functions and just give a, a brief nod to the correlation secure trapdoor functions. So uh, as we saw in the last talk, some lossy trapdoor functions, and I guess I'll just go over the uh, what exactly they are again. They're introduced by Pikert and Waters, and they're functions. Um, you're given a function f, and it can behave in one of two ways. Either it's injective. Uh, which means it's a one-to-one -one function, and there's a trap door that allows it to be inverted, or it's lossy, which means that it loses information, and uh, in particular the image of the function is smaller than the domain. Uh, more specifically, if we can measure the lossiness, we can quantify it, if the domain is uh, n bits and the image is n minus l bits, then we say that, the, that f has l bits of lossiness. And the security property in these functions is that the descriptions of injective functions and lossy functions are computationally indistinguishable. Um, and it's actually this security property that uh, allows for uh, constructions. So, what, so that's what they are. So what can we do with them? Well, lots of different things. Um, Pikert and Waters suggested some applications. Uh, these included collision-resistant hash functions, oblivious transfer, and their, their killer app was uh, CCA secure, so chosen ciphertext secure public key encryption. Uh, but since the original paper, there have been other applications, including uh, deterministic public key encryption by Boldereva et al., and security against selective opening attacks, which was uh, Bellari and others, and uh, there have been uh, a bunch of other papers. Uh, you can find a full list in, in the proceedings. So, and all, all of these uh, constructions use lossy chapter functions just as, as a modular primitive, uh, so nothing in particular about the construction itself. So, given all these uses, we'd like to have a, a big library of lossy chapter functions based on different computational assumptions. So we can choose the one best for the application or if some assumption gets broken. So what, well, so what kind of constructions do we have? So Pikert and Waters gave constructions based on, for one based on decision Diffie-Hellman, and the second based on learning with errors, which is a, a lattice assumption. So we add, in our paper, we add new constructions, one based on quadrat quadratic residuosity uh, assumption. Uh, in the next talk, we'll see a, a similar construction uh, that's based on uh, an apparently weaker assumption of two versus three primes. And uh, for details comparing these assumptions, again, we'll refer you to, refer you to the full version of the paper. Uh, this quadratic residuosity construction also generalizes to higher powers, so I guess eth power residuosity. We also give a composite residuosity construction or or the Paillet assumptions, also known as. Uh, this particular construction was discovered independently by Bodereva and, and et al. We also give a construction based on the delinear assumption, this which simplifies and generalizes the Pikert and Waters DDH construction. So we also give a correlation secure chapter function, and it's just uh, brief overview, overview of what that is. So correlation security is a generalization of a one-way function to correlated inputs, uh, uh, introduced by Rosen and Segev. And this says, basically, if you're given a collection of functions, then they're correlated secure if, if, if they, when evaluated on k-tuples from some distribution, uh, that the function is one way. And Rosen and Segev show that this security property is enough to construct chosen ciphertext secure encryption, and that it's implied by lossy trapdoor functions. And in particular, we'll see in the next talk that it's implied by lossy trapdoor functions with any amount of lossiness, even, even a bit or less. So our contribution in this area is a new construction uh, based on the hardness of syndrome decoding, which is a, a coding theory assumption. Uh, it's related to the dual of the uh, Michaelis crypto system. So, but now I'll focus on the lossy trapdoor functions, uh, in particular, 
give outlines of two of our constructions, first being the quadratic residuosity construction. So the quadratic residuosity construction is based on some, well, some, some old observations. Uh, we have, a, if we have an RSA modulus n, it's p times q, where p and q are 3 mod 4, then it's well known that the squaring function, x goes to x squared mod n, uh, at least on, on z mod n star, this is a 4 to 1 map. So the image is a quarter the size of the domain, so there are two bits of lossiness. And uh, it's also well known that we can take a unique square root, so we can invert the squaring function if we know two more bits of information. Uh, and those bits are the Jacobi symbol, uh, which is a, just is minus 1 or 1 on z mod n star, and 0 if the number is not in z mod n star. And uh, the second bit is the sine. So here we represent x as an integer between minus n over 2 and n over 2. And we take the sine in the obvious way. And um, so more specifically, if we have four square roots of a, of a square mod n, and we call them plus or minus x0 or plus or minus x1. The, uh, the Jacobi symbol will tell us whether we've got, whether we're working with x0 or x1, right, because the two are, two are different here. The Jacobi symbol of the plus or minus x1 is different from plus or minus x0. And the uh, sign then will tell us which one, given the Jacobi symbol, which square root it is. And here we're uh, specifically using the fact that P and Q are, are 3 mod 4. So, all right, so we have this lossy function that's squaring, and we know how to invert it given these extra bits of information. Um, so to create an injective function, we need to encode these extra two bits somehow, um, for example, as in Raven-Williams uh, encryption. But in particular, we need to do it in, in a computationally indistinguishable way. So that, that's the problem. And the solution is to put these extra two bits in the exponent of quadratic non-residues. So more specifically, uh, we'll define two functions. Function h uh, gives information about the sign. It's uh, just defined to be 1 if the sign is positive and 0 if it's negative. And the function j captures information about the Jacobi symbol. It's basically an additive version of the Jacobi symbol. It's 1 if the Jacobi symbol is minus 1 and 0 otherwise. So now we define our function by choosing uh, integers r and s in z mod n, or z mod n star. r has Jacobi symbol minus 1, so it's automatically a quadratic non-residue. s has Jacobi symbol 1, and we choose it to be a quadratic non-residue. And then we can define our injective function. So it's, it's described by the, the, the triple R, S, and N. Um, and what we do, so we take X, we square it, then we multiply R to the J and S to the H and do that all mod N. So, well, why should you believe me that this is injective and can be inverted? Um, so now I'll show you how to, how to invert this function, which... I guess prove that's it. Prove that it's injective. Um, so first of all, we, to recover the Jacobi symbol, um, well, we use the fact that the Jacobi symbol is multiplicative. In particular, if we take the Jacobi symbol of f of x, then uh, it's the same as the Jacobi symbol of x, because the other two factors here. Um, right, the other two factors. Because uh, x squared has Jacobi symbol 1, because it's square. s has Jacobi symbol 1, so we're left only with r. Uh, and that term has Jacobi symbol plus or minus 1, depending on what j is. So once, once we learn that, once we learn j, we can, so we, can, um, we can sort of kill off that factor and recover x squared times s to the h. And now x squared is, is clearly a square, so then... Um, whether this term is a quadratic residue will tell us the value of h of x. So 
So, in particular, we invert as follows. First, we uh, compute the Jacobi symbol of f, and that gives us the Jacobi symbol of x. Um, multiply by r to the minus j to cancel out that term. And now we can determine what the, whether the result is a quadratic residue to learn the function h. Multiply by s to the minus h to kill off that term. And finally, we're left with just x squared. Uh, we compute four square roots and find the one that matches the values of h and j that were computed. So now we have an injective function based on, on squaring. Now the same function is lossy if we choose, instead of choosing s to be um, a quadratic non-residue, we choose s to be a quadratic residue. And particularly you can show that this function is 2 to 1 uh, on all of z mod n uh, except for 0. So it, it, it particularly loses the information about the sign of x. And now it's pretty immediate that the lossy functions are indistinguishable from the injective functions under the QR assumption because the description is r, s, and n. The only difference is whether s is a quadratic residue or not, and that's exactly the, the quadratic residuosity assumption. So some extensions. Um, so as I described it here, the domain of the function depends on the, the function in the index, uh, in particular n. And for some applications, we need functions that don't depend on, on the index. Um, so we, we can uh, extend the domain uh, in, a, in a pretty straightforward way. And you don't achieve a full bit of lossiness, but it's some fraction of a bit. This, uh, this extension, well, all these extensions are in the full version. Um, we also can use, instead of using squaring, we can use raised, raising to the eth power. Uh, and then there's a, there's a analog analogous eth power residuosity assumption. And for, um, we can achieve much more lossiness this way. The e has to be small enough so that the coppersmith attacks don't apply. So that's um, roughly smaller than uh, n to the 1 fourth. And in p uh, computing the analog of the Jacobi symbol, which is necessary for decryption, uh, is time polynomial in E in general. Um, so not, not in log E, so that seems to be a, a problem. But we can get around this by choosing E to be a number with lots of small prime factors. Uh, do the computation modulo each small factor, and then use Chinese remainder theorem. Um, and and de the details involve uh, some Eisenstein reciprocity in number fields, which is a generalization of quadratic res uh, reciprocity. So again, these details are all in the full version on ePrint. So now, um, I'd like to describe the lossy chapter function created from a delinear assumption. So here's the basic observation. So let's take our input x, and it's just a bit string, 0, 1 to the n, and then let's view it as a length n vector. So just a vector of length n with uh, entries in 0, 1. Now if we have some matrix over, some, over a finite field fp, and we define our function just to be matrix vector multiplication. So the output is also is a vector of fp to the n. And the observation is this function can be lossy or injective. Uh, it's injective if m has full rank, rank n. Uh, then if we know the inverse of m, then we can invert. It's lossy if the rank is small. In particular, if it is rank d, then the image has size at most p to the d. So if p to the d is less than 2 to the n, Right, if the image is less size, the image is less than the domain, then we have, uh, then we have lossiness. So this, this is a good start, except, well, we can easily distinguish these two cases. Uh, given a matrix over FP, it's pretty easy to compute the rank. So how do we get around this? Well, so what we do is encode, we encode the matrix M in the exponent of a group where discrete log is hard. So... Uh, we let G be a group of order P, uh, the little g be a generator, and 
on the matrix have entries m, i, j in f, p. And now instead of describing the function by the matrix m, we describe it by the matrix of group elements g to the m. So it's g raised to each entry of m. Now the trap door uh, remains m inverse. And now we can evaluate, given g to the m, we can evaluate g to the m times x. Uh, simply given x, this is more an exercise in notation than anything else. And similarly, if we're given m inverse, we can apply that also in the exponent to recover g to the x. And now we need to take a discrete log to recover the entries of x. But since x is a 0, 1 vector, these discrete logs are easy. It's determining whether the entry is the identity or not. So that was the description of our function. And for security, um, we rely on theorem of uh, Bonnet et al., which uh, did the case d equals 1, and now are in negative in general, um, which, who said that if the d-linear assumption, or they proved that if the d-linear assumption holds in the group G, then this G to the M where the matrix has full rank is indistinguishable from the G to the M where the matrix has rank D. So, well, so what exactly is D-linear assumption? This is a generalization of decision Diffie-Hellman that was designed so that it holds, or it could hold, in groups with a, even with a D-linear map. So the D equals 1, so the one linear assumption is decision Diffie-Hellman, the two linear assumption could hold in groups with a bilinear map, uh, and it's also known as decision linear assumption. And so when we, when we apply this function with a matrix of rank D, the amount of lossiness is N minus D log P. So if we choose the parameters correctly, we can achieve um, varying amounts of lossiness. So, some observations about this construction. This, uh, we sort of, we simplify the, and generalize the Piker waters construction based on al -Gamal. In particular, um, they encrypt the matrix M so that it can be decrypted. And decrypting the matrix M in our case would require taking discrete logs, but we observe that we don't actually need to do this. We just need to use the functionality of M. So this saves some space. And then if you want to generalize uh, their construction directly, then you'll have to use generalized alchemal encryption, which has D group elements for each ciphertext, so, that, so it would be D times as large. So as we said before, uh, we can choose the parameters to achieve different amounts of lossiness. This construction also admits an all but one generalization. The, well, the construction works uh, for all D, but the, the, there's a a gap in the proof for D bigger than 1, so we only get a, a proof for DDH. So I invite you to try to uh, plug the hole for, for D greater than 1. Um, and this uh, particular, so this all but one generalization is, is used in uh, the Piker Waters CCA secure encryption construction. So in conclusion, um, I've described some constructions of lossy trapdoor functions based on the quadratic residuosity and delinear assumptions. And in the paper, there's also a construction based on the composite residuosity or Paillet assumption, and also a construction of correlation secure trapdoor functions based on syndrome decoding. So these constructions expand our library of lossy trapdoor functions and therefore expand the methods that we have to build new crypto systems in a modular way from these primitives. Thank you.